Hello, and welcome to Calvary. We are so glad that you joined us today. If you're joining us for the first time, a very special welcome to you. We would love to get to know you today. So say hi in the chat, click the welcome tab, let us know who you are, and a member of our team will connect you this week, and we have a Starbucks gift card to send you. A big thank you to our Calvary family for your continued generosity. You've contributed to ministry around the world. You can continue to partner with us by giving online, following the instructions at the bottom of your screen. Giving is safe and easy. All right, Calvary, let's worship. Well, welcome to church. Why don't we stand up together? We're going to get a chance to worship the Lord. Praise Him. See the tomb away he lay. See the stone roll away. He is risen. He is risen. He's alive. See his hands, see his feet, touch his scars and believe. He is risen, he is risen, he's alive.
You know, the Bible says that there's a song in heaven that's being sung constantly, 24 seven. And in Revelation, it says there's elders sitting around a throne and they, they lay down their crowns before the Lord Jesus. And they, they sing this song, they sing, you are worthy our Lord and God to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and by your will they were created and have their being. We have a chance to join in that song this morning. We've been singing all glory, all honor. The Lord God created all things through Jesus, through him and in him and for him. And he holds our lives, like our lives are in his hands. So why don't we let go a bit and make him Lord? We say, Jesus, you are Lord. What does that mean? Well, allow him to be Lord. Allow him to take his rightful place in your life this morning as we lay down our crowns, as we let go of what we're holding on tightly. Let's worship him.
Hey, this is Vince. I'm so glad you're able to join us in church this morning. Uh, if there's something going on in life that you would like to have someone pray with you for, make sure you hit that live prayer button. Someone on my team or myself will make sure we engage with you and, and pray for whatever's going on in your life. Now, let's head into today's message with Pastor Steve. Show him some love in the chat. Hello, happy Father's Day, and welcome to episode three of our One of a Kind series. This is a series where we're, we're looking at how God has created us to, to live in this world. And so far, Pastor Steve has taken us through the idea of mind transformation, because our, our thoughts affect our actions. They have a profound effect on us so we need to take our thoughts captive for obedience to Christ. And today we're going to switch gears and start looking at what we, re we were created for, the things that we do. Pastor Steve and Susan are traveling to a conference today, so keep them in your prayers. And for anyone who doesn't know who I am, my name's Brad. I'm one of the pastors here at the church. I'm actually the student ministries pastor. And my wife, Melissa, and I have two kids our daughter, Ray, is four, and our son, Kyson, will be two in October. And some of you know this, but our son, Kyson, was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes three weeks after his first birthday. Uh, to be diagnosed with, with diabetes at that age is rare, but it does happen. Uh, and through the intervention of doctors and the advocacy of doctors and ourselves and even family members, we were able to get Kyson on an insulin pump system that continuously gives insulin to him throughout the day. We can type in different numbers and, and give him different rates at different times of the day for different activity levels. And it, it's able to manage his, his diabetes quite well. He's also on a sensor that updates the pump every five minutes as to where his, his, his uh, blood glucose is. And we get that sent to our phones as well so that we have peace of mind. It's, it's a fantastic system, and we're so grateful for the technology that exists today. But Kyson still has to go to diabetes clinic visits uh, uh, every three months. So we were actually at a clinic visit just two weeks ago. And at this visit... Kyson, who is just a little monkey and climbing all over everything in the waiting room, trying to open doors and trying to get behind counters, just running around like a, a tiny madman, he, he, uh, he was just going wild. And uh, eventually we're taken into the room where he is continuing to go wild, jumping up, into climbing into the sink, opening every cabinet, and we have to meet with dietitians and nurses, and then finally the doctor comes in, and she opens the door, and she's smiling brightly, and the first thing she, out of her mouth is, Kyson, you're a hero. And I was like, what kind of hero is he? He's just messed up your entire office for the last hour. And she said, a little boy who was waiting to see me in, in, the, in the waiting area saw that you had a pump. And he said, I'd like to try that pump because that little boy had a pump. He was a hero. And even though Paul doesn't talk about uh, this type of thing, Kyson was just existing the way he was in the world, and he made a positive impact on another person just by being who he is and, and, and just living his life, essentially. This kid saw Kyson thriving and running around and thought, I'd like to be where that kid is. 
And in Ephesians, Paul instructs us on, on how to exist in the world as Jesus followers, not as diabetes patients, but as Jesus followers, so that we have a positive impact on others. And I think that's what we all want. So today we're going to camp out in the book of Ephesians, and we're going to start by looking at our core verse in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. And it says this, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Okay, now this passage might sound a little odd, because after all, we talk a lot about being saved without works. In fact, we're going to read this passage in context now. So we're going to read from Ephesians 2.1 all the way to the end of 2.10 so that we can get the context and talk about it a little bit. And Paul says, You were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath. So remember, we all were like that, like the rest of humanity. But God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised up with him, seated, with, seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works." which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. You can hear in this passage, read in this passage, the richness and the beauty of God's love for us. But then we're left with this question. Right back to back, we have, you're saved by grace through faith and not by works. And then we get, you're created for good works in Christ Jesus. And we can be left with what? is the answer to this. What is it? We can get it all kind of twisted up because we, we, we kind of are focusing on two different things in this passage. So I want to take some time right now to untwist this. So first of all, we need to understand what the word grace means and what the word faith means. The word or collection of words that we translate as grace into, in English those words are, mean gift. The most prominent of them is charis, and it means gift. So we could take the, um, the verse and say, we are saved by faith, we are, we are, for by God's gift you have been saved through faith. But to understand what we mean by gift, we need to understand how the ancient world worked with gift-giving. It was very common in the ancient world, just like it's common today. Some of you may have received a gift this morning, or maybe you're going to receive one later today. Maybe you've received a gift on your birthday or at Christmas or at another milestone event in your life. We often give gifts. But in the ancient world, they gave gifts for a specific reason. See, honor was the social currency of the day. Today, the social currency could be considered views, clicks, likes, um, followers. All those things are social currency. But back in the first century, honor was the social currency. So the rich and the noble people wanted as much honor as they could acquire. And they did it by giving gifts to others. This could be in the form of financial gifts, land, or often lavish parties. And what the giver got in return from the receiver was honor and respect. And when they gained honor, they gained social status. 
However, they wouldn't just give gifts to anybody. In fact, there were groups of people who were deemed unworthy of receiving gifts. So there were groups that just, it was foolish to give gifts to. But Paul uses gift in an entirely different way. John M. G. Barclay defines biblical grace as a gift given without regard for our worth. See, the way Paul talks about the gift of grace, the gift of God, or the gift, or God's gift in Christ Jesus, is a gift that is given without any regard for your social status, for your your ethnicity, your job, your education level, or any other social identifier that people can place on you today to judge our worth. None of that. The gift is given freely without respect for anything that you have done. When Paul says you're saved by grace through, uh, and not through works, he's saying that God's gift is given to you regardless of anything that you've done or regardless of, of whatever social status you may have. And in a world where we are trying to gain social status, this is very good news because God won't cancel you. God won't turn his back on you. God's not looking for the right number of followers or the right words to say. He is looking for faithful people. And that brings us to biblical faith. Biblical faith is trust, specifically trust in God's gift of Jesus. So we could say you have been saved by God's gift of Jesus through trust in God's gift of Jesus. And what I mean by that is that because Jesus willingly went to the cross, because the wrath of God was poured out on him for your sins, that gift is offered freely to you, and you receive it through trusting that what Jesus did on the cross, that paying the price for your sin, for all your wrongdoing, all your junk, all your moral failures, that that was enough, that that was sufficient. You were saved by grace through faith. You were saved by God's gift through trusting that his gift was sufficient and is sufficient and will always be sufficient to cover your sin. You are a part of his family. And, the, and Paul uses very strong language to say that we were dead in our sins, but we were made alive in Christ Elsewhere, he says, you were slaves to sin, and now you are slaves to righteousness. Because you see, the gift is given without regard for our worth. But this gift is so life-changing, so amazing, so benevolent, that it recreates us. It transforms us. It changes us. And then we are recreated in Christ Jesus for good works. We're saved from our sins, not by our own doing, our own initiative, or anything that we did, so that we can be brought into God's family to be the light in the world, to live as Christians in the world and spread the good news everywhere we go. And we could word it this way. God's gift starts in the head with hearing the good news, penetrates to the heart as it transforms us, and then moves out in our character and our interactions with other people. The evidence that we have received God's gift comes out in how we lived. We are saved from sin and death so that we can be recreated for good works. In other words, to live as God intended from the very beginning, to live as humanity is supposed to live, in right relationship with God and each other. We're not perfect at it. We still struggle with a sin nature. We still stumble and, and make mistakes. We're prone to rebel at times. We're prone to decide that we want to be in charge for a little while. 
But we always strive, strive to live as God intends us to live. That's why the Bible is full of instructions on how to live. So now we're going to turn and do a quick survey of Ephesians to see how Paul develops the idea that we are created for good works. So we're going to look at three passages to construct one single sentence that we are called to do. The first part that we're going to look at is, in, is the first phrase of this sentence is, we are set apart. Ephesians 1, verses 3 to 6, says this, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love he predestined us for adoption as sons and daughters through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has blessed us with, beloved. The phrase that we can look at there very clearly is that we should be holy and blameless before him. In all of that, we are brought into God's family. We have that, adopted as sons and daughters into God's family to be holy and blameless. To be holy means to be set apart, to be different from the world around us. In the book of Revelation, people cry out, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. It's, it's mentioned three times because God is completely set apart, completely different from us. And when he gets a hold of us, when he saves us, he sets us apart from the world around us. We're supposed to look different. We're supposed to act different. We're supposed to be different. And to be blameless is what Christ did for us. He took on our sin and gave us his righteousness. So the first thing to remember is that we are set apart. We're set apart. Penetrates our mind, our, our, our hearts, and moves out. We are set apart. Next, we are set apart to live our calling. We are set apart to live our calling calling. In Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, we read, I therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love. We are called to walk in a manner worthy of our calling, of the fact that we have been taken out of the world and set apart, we are to live out that reality with humility and gentleness and patience, bearing with one another in love. Humility means thinking of others more than you think of yourself. Gentleness, patience. You know, this week, my daughter, we, we bought a, uh, an above-ground pool um, just, just uh, in May during some of those heat waves we were experiencing here. And um, my daughter has wanted to go in it every single day. It is so cold, and she shivers the entire time, but she knows she's not allowed to go in it without Daddy because Mommy's not getting in that pool until it warms up a little bit. And so on Monday, I told her, you can't go in the pool until... Kyson goes down for a nap. And all day, all day, she's like, is Kyson going down for a nap now? Is Kyson going down for a nap now? Is Kyson going down for a nap now? What she's learning is patience. There are things that we might want. There are things that we might demand of God even. But he calls us to be patient. That means it's not going to be easy. If it were easy, it wouldn't be called patience. Patience. He wants us to patiently wait in expectation. 
which is what my daughter is learning to do, but she's only four. So we are called, we are set apart to live our calling patiently with humility and gentleness and love. We are set apart to live our calling through good works. Now we turn to Ephesians 4, verses 17 to 24, and it reads this way, Now this I say and testify in the Lord, that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their mind. So to pause here for a second, we are transformed in our minds. It penetrates to our heart, and now we no longer walk the way we used to walk. And he goes on and says, they are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart, mind to heart. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy practices of every kind of impurity. But this is not the way you learned Christ, assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus, to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your mind, to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God, in true righteousness and holiness. We are to be transformed in our minds, in our hearts, and to walk out our lives, not as we once did, and for those of us who've grown up in church, not as maybe the world would influence us to do, but to walk out our lives the way that Christ has called us to, by being set apart to live our calling through good works in our heads, in our hearts, and in our actions. And then one more verse to illustrate this. Paul says in Ephesians 5, Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. So we're set apart to live our calling through good works by imitating Christ and we find that by, by, by searching the Scriptures and understanding that the way that he loved people when we walk in love is that Christ loved people sacrificially. That he did good by seeking the benefit of other people. In fact, he sought the benefit of other people when they were his enemies. But this leaves us with a question. How can I live my calling? And I want to give you two ways that we're going to dive into a, a, a few subpoints on them that we live out our calling. And the first way is to sort out what you believe and why you believe it. Sort out what you believe and why you believe it. This is so important because we, we're called to actually be able to give an answer for the hope that is within us. We are told to do that, to be able to answer for what we believe and why we believe it. So we can ask ourselves, what is it that we believe about who Jesus is? What is it that we believe about his death and resurrection? What is it that we believe about what it means to be human? And we can take it even a step further and say, what do we believe about how we are to interact with the people around us, with the culture around us? How are we to love our neighbor as ourselves? What do we believe about it? And then ask ourselves, why do we believe it? Is it because we read it in the Bible? Is it because we heard someone else say it? Is it because of something that we read online or heard on, from the media? Or what was it? If it wasn't from the Bible, well, we got a problem. So once you've sorted out what you believe and why you believe it, Compare it to what is in the Bible. And if this sounds like a tall order, it, it is, because it's a big book. It has lots of things in it. But I want to give you a couple of tools that can help you work this out. There's a website called openbible.info, 
openbible.info. And if you go there, the search bar actually says at the beginning, what does the Bible say about, and then you fill in the blank, and it'll bring up verses. So if you want to ask, what does the Bible say about culture? Look it up. What does the Bible say about loving my neighbor as myself? Type it in. It'll come up with them. It's a fantastic, quick resource. Another way is to just go to the back of your Bible and look in the concordance and look up the words that you're trying to figure out and then go to those verses. But take some time to actually sort out what you believe and why you believe it. Because we've got to start in our minds and allow that to penetrate to our hearts. And if you're not a follower of Jesus and you found your way to this stream, I want to give you a resource, too, that you can look up. It's called coldcasechristianity.com. And it's a website made by a man named J. Warner Wallace, who was a former atheist, who set out to investigate Christianity as a homicide detective in order to disprove it because he was sick of seeing criminals claiming to be Christians. And in the process, he became a Christian himself. So I'm confident if you take time to look in there and honestly search and allow yourself to be transformed, you will be transformed. And then, once we've compared what we believe, why we believe it, to what the Bible says, wherever necessary, repent. All that means is to turn away from your old self and go Jesus' way. Change your mind on things. Go the way that Jesus would have you go. If you're a Christian, this is a daily task for us to consider the, the things, the errors that we've done, the places where we've gone off track, and to ask God to place us back on the narrow path. If you're not a Christian, if you're not a follower of Jesus, but you've heard some things today where you say, I'm interested in that. What we are told to do is to repent from your old ways. That means acknowledge that you're no longer in charge of your life and put Jesus in charge of your life. Say, I want to follow you. And then you follow him. You grab a Bible. You learn the words that he said, the things that he taught. Head, heart, out. The second thing that we do once we've figured out what we believe, why we believe it, once we've compared it to the Bible, once we've repented, we love and serve others. There's a couple of things that we can do to love and serve others. First, get to know people. Just get to know people. Ask questions. Become friends with people. One, one problem that I know I have is that I'm not good at asking questions. I'm really good at talking about answers to questions. I can ask questions of the Bible, but then I just want to give answers. Something that I need to work on is to truly get to know people. You can do that by joining a small group. You can do that by, by just talking to people in your workplace, by actually getting to know them and understand them and where they're coming from so that you can share the love of Christ with them in a way that they can receive it, in a way that they can understand it. So get to know people. Ask questions. Become friends with people. Get into relationship with other Christians who can support you on this journey of sharing and doing good works in the world. And the other way that we love and serve others is that we use our gifts to serve. And I'm not just talking about the spiritual gifts that we talk about and read about in the Bible. I'm talking about your talents, your passions, your interests. You can use those things to love and serve other people while pointing them to Christ. I heard it put this way when trying to discern your calling. One of my teachers, David Wood, said, if you want to know your calling, think about whatever makes you weep and pound the table. Whatever makes you sad and angry, maybe and or angry. Whatever makes you weep and pound the table. Are there things that you look at in the world that make you sad? 
Are there things that you wish we would do better? Are there things that you wish that we would, we would uh, places where you wish we could influence more? Are there things that make you angry about what's going on in the world today? Those are places that we are called to go to. Those are places that we are called to develop influence in. I know for me, I get sad when young people walk away from the faith because they had doubts that were unaddressed. That's why I seek to answer their questions, to address their doubts head on, so that they, 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 they know someone is there that hears them and is working with them to find answers to their doubts and questions. And there are many things that make me angry when I see things, people misrepresenting Jesus, misrepresenting Christianity, misrepresenting the Bible. It upsets me. It makes me angry. So I seek to teach and learn as much as I can so that I can have an influence in that area. These are things that we can all do. So what are your interests? What are your passions? What are your talents? What makes you sad? What makes you angry? Find a way to use those things in those areas to influence the world for the better. So we can be like my son, navigating the diabetes world, existing in the diabetes world, and having a positive impact on someone around him. We too can do that for Christ in our world because we are set apart to live our calling through good works. We're saved by grace, not by our worth but we are called to do something in this world. Let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, I thank you for your amazing love for us, that you gave us such an amazing, wonderful, beautiful gift of, your, of yourself, giving up yourself for us, laying down your life for us, not just as an example of how to live in this world, but as a true replacement for, for us on the cross as someone who bore our sins upon yourself. And I pray for every follower of Jesus that we would truly sit down and hammer out to, to really truly know what we believe and why we believe it, compare it to your word, and then if we need to repent, repent. And that we would love others by spending time with them, getting to know them, developing relationships with other people, and that we would use our gifts, our talents, our passions in areas that make us sad and angry so that we can be a positive influence in the world around us and that we would recognize that each of us is uniquely made for this era to be a positive influence for Christ in our world and that you would teach us where to go. For anyone that doesn't know you, I pray that they would openly investigate your word, that they would be willing to go where the evidence leads, willing to, and that you would lead them, Holy Spirit, to the truth, that they would learn the truth, and that they were to repent and turn to Jesus. And I pray for every father, every father figure here today, that we would be an example in our homes, and anywhere else that we have influence of faith, love, and service for Christ. I pray that you would strengthen every father to lead his family well. We love you so much. We thank you for your amazing grace. In your name, amen. Thanks for joining us today, everyone. And we'll see you next time for Calvary Church Online. As a final act of worship, we want to give you the opportunity to worship God with your tithes and your offerings. This is a chance for all of us who call Calvary home to honor God with what he has given us and to trust him to multiply and grow and further the ministry of our church, not only here in our building, but in our city, our nation, and our world. And we want to thank our entire Calvary family for your generosity. It's because of you that we've been able to partner with local mission, missions organizations like the City Dream Center or Night Shift. And we've been able to partner with international missions organizations and missions partners to bless people and further the gospel in our community, 
our city, our nation, and our world. So thank you for that. And if you'd like to partner with us, you can do so by following the information at the bottom of the screen. And giving is safe and easy. Before you go, I'd like to pray for you. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for every giver, for every gift. We pray that you would take what comes in and use it to further your kingdom, that we would see amazing things done. I pray that we would be blessed by your move in our city, in our nation, and in our world. We thank you for the support that we have from our Calvary family. We love you so much. In your name, amen. Thank you for joining us today, everyone, and we'll see you next time for Calvary Church Online. Mm-hmm.